Hello, late night listeners. Uh, this is Brian, and I wanted to let you know that we have a Patreon. It's a really fun thing. It's a great way to support the show, and it gets you access to all kinds of exclusive stuff. We have exclusive mini episodes. We have videos of me, for example, writing music for various things of the show. Leighton's doing all sorts of stuff, and it's just a really fun community. You also get access to our Discord if you sign up for our $5 a month tier or up. So uh, if you like the show and you like what you hear, please check us out over on Patreon. It's really a great way to to support us. Thanks so much. And enjoy Late Night with Brian Wecht. It's my Don Pardo impression. I can't even remember the last time we did a full episode of just us. Yeah, it would have been like two weeks ago, maybe. Obviously, we were doing minis, but um, yeah, we haven't had like an actual chat in a little while. I had the realization that I think we've spent more time together via Zencaster or through this podcast than we have in real life. Does that sound right to you? It's definitely close, for sure. Yeah, because we started this podcast January. This is episode 28. I believe. Yeah, and I think our our final real life record was with Allie, which was one of the very first episodes. It was like episode five or something, right? Yeah. Wow. Fuck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I am um, the week that I moved here. Vern and I went to a Father John Misty concert at the Greek Theater, which was an awesome concert. We were just talking about that, weren't? We? Was that on a mini episode? I think we we're just talking about that. It might have been, but there is a moment during one of the songs, because, you know, a lot of his stuff is very, like, political, satirical stuff. Uh, yeah. And he just did did the most well-timed fuck in the middle of the song. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think about that almost on a daily basis. It just the, the tone of it coming out of his wonderful voice mouth. Yeah, we were talking about Father John <laughs> I I yeah. was thinking before we started recording today, I was like, what the fuck have I been doing these past two weeks? What's I don't even remember what I talked about. Like, if I watched anything, I do I have a what's popping other than just oh, me yeah. staring into space? I'm worried that I am telling the same five stories over and over again, about a month apart, and completely forgetting <laughs> that I've discussed them. Yeah, holy shit. Right? So this must happen to experienced broadcasters, which I do not consider myself, you know, whatever, six months into this podcast yet. But I know people have their things that they talk about, but I don't know. Like, I, I'm a little bit worried that I'm just saying the same shit over and over again. In real life, I constantly worry that I'm such a broken record. And like, when I talk to somebody who I've known a long time and speak to a lot, like Jory, where I'm just like, he he he's one of those people who has such a good memory, uh, and like you know that's a good friend because they you know they just remember everything you tell them. And I'm always like, oh, this poor man having <laughs> to tolerate me <laughs> saying the this same thing shit, again. the same stories, the same jokes. <laughs> Try being married this October, Rachel and I, which is uh, less than two months away. We are thirteenth anniversary. Wow, congratulations! Thanks. And at some point, like. You know, uh, you know each other's stories and stuff because we've been together for almost two years before we got married ish. That sounds about right. So we've been together about 15 years. Yeah, it's a long time. And at some point, you know, you're like, okay, I know that story. I know that story. I know that story. But it never, I mean, at least with Rachel, Rachel's so awesome and smart and funny that it never feels like the same thing over and over again. I can't speak for what her uh, experience of living with me is, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's amazing because why wouldn't it be? But I do worry about that, that I'm just like saying the same shit over and over again. Yeah. I realized recently that by this point, my oldest friendships in terms of like people I've known for a decade are people that I met on Tumblr. <laughs> Wow. Who I've been in touch with this entire time and who I just love to death. And we met through like stupid fandom shit and shit posting and like late night tiny chat calls and all that. Like those are some very special friendships to me. What fandoms? Tell me about these fandoms that you met people through. Um, Portal 2 was a big one. Mm. 
And another one through um, being really big fans of... (laughs) (laughs) No! That got bleeped, but through that mystery fandom of a justifiably canceled person. (laughs) (laughs) Who wasn't canceled at the time. No, no, of course, yes. Yeah, but that that would have been 10 years ago. I would have been uh, 13, 14. So I I guess we're coming up on like almost 10 years. But um, yeah, I mean, my parents were always staunchly... I guess my mom more than my dad, like, never talk to strangers on the internet. And so what do you do? Talk to strangers on the internet. Um, And so it would be like staying up past the time where my parents went to sleep so I could get on Skype calls with my friends and all that jazz. Wow. Yeah, really lovely. Just great to know people for that long. Because there's there's like that really weird intimacy to internet friendships where like, you know them for a long time and, and you know them really well, like on an emotional personality level, but there are just like basic facts about them that you don't know. It's like, I have no idea what your last name is. I don't even know how to say your first name. Like, you have a dog? <laughs> this is very interesting to me because I have literally no friends like that. And I think that is, you know, it's partly my age. Like mm-hmm. when I was 13, that wasn't really a thing. I mean, I was definitely on, as I've talked about, BBSs when I was uh, not too much older than 13, probably 14 or 15. But I wouldn't say I made friends there, partly because I had parents who were actually decent about oversight and also because I was terrified of literally everything. So I have no friends like that are, are just purely internet friends. Everyone I know that I consider a close friend is someone that I you know, have spent time with in some capacity. Yeah, there's, I remember, you know, when I was a teen, like my internet friends would go to conventions together and like be there in real life. And I would be like, oh my God, I would kill to see you in real life. And you actually met Saya, who's one of my oldest friends who, um, Craig in Dream Daddy is like, they share a last name because I wanted to name him after her. Um, Aww. but yeah, she, she flew out to the Leighton night show, uh, and was hanging out with us. Yes. I remember that. The first time she visited me and crashed on my couch, it was just like, the best thing in the world because it was like, damn, when we were teenagers, we were literally like fantasizing about being friends and hanging out in person. And then it was us just like getting drunk. And we we started writing a Homestuck AU when we were teenagers. And we were rereading through that because it was just like in our Google Drive. Oh, wait a minute. Can you do it? Do you have it? Oh, God, hold on. Do it. Do it. I don't know if I can stand this. Uh, well, uh, I want to hear it. The moment you said that, you realized you, what you had committed yourself to. Yeah, you're right. We got to deliver on these promises. Here at Late Night with Brian White, we're known for nothing other than delivering on promises. And that's a promise. <laughs> so go for it. It's called Condo Trapped. <laughs> Can you tell me what Homestuck is? It's like the odyssey of a certain era of the internet. There's something really fascinating about it because if you weren't reading it as it was, you know, being made, there's no way you could understand like the scale of the fandom and like the the text because it's so fucking long and for like days, hours of reading, nothing happens. And when I was catching up to like the current Wait, and it's a collectively created thing or mm-hmm semi it was the kind of thing where a lot of like fan artists and fan writers eventually got involved with it but it's like a long form webcomic that eventually has some like video game elements and like animations that was always the thing that everybody freaked out over like they would be really long animations where basically like all the really dramatic plot points would happen Mm -hmm. it's about a bunch of kids who start playing a video game called suburb and it triggers the apocalypse essentially and then they meet a bunch of like aliens from an alternate universe that they start communicating with which are like the trolls which if you've seen the gray-skinned horn people that's them have i you you i i showed you that picture of danny elfman that was edited to look like (laughs) oh yes yes of course yeah but actually you know what so there's this one animation that was a really big dramatic thing that everybody lost their shit over called cascade and also worth noting toby fox who you know obviously famous for undertale by this point was like doing all the music for homestuck and it had banging fucking music it's so good i'm gonna send you so we can get live cascade uh reaction all right, there's a guy in like a blue hoodie or cape or something 
yeah. something that looks like whatever that thing in Age of Ultron is, Sokovia. Maybe that wasn't a cape. Maybe it's a tail. I'm going to interpret nothing. No, no. I, okay, big hammer. Guy has a cape tail, big hammer, some kind of robots happening. There's gems uh, going on that's either a cloud or a wispy frog. Uh, someone is injured, and oh, there's like a fox angel person. Uh, <laughs> wedding <funny>. ring. <laughs> uh, there's, that looks like Earth. Okay, there's that angel fox person, I think, again, with the sword through them. But right, no, that's not a wedding ring. It was a, a plant, a red miles, which sounds like a serial killer. Uh, <laughs> wow, red miles. Okay, it looks like we're looking at the back of a retina. Lots of blood vessels. Uh huh. Oh, a giant. Oh, like a cosmic frog in whose belly lives the galaxy. Yep, that all checks out. Feel free to scrub through this. No, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Uh, you just stop me when this gets boring, which I suspect it might have already. All right, now we're traveling through definitely space, possibly time. All right, we're on Earth. Uh, let's see. All right, is like the fox or it's a castle. I couldn't tell if that was a person. All right, now someone has some kind of detonator. Uh-oh, something's going to happen. They flicked a switch. There's a guy wearing kind of like a yellow thing. All right, now there's some... Um, there's a countdown. Looks like a bunch of grays. Looking at a, cor a flower, corpse flower. What the fuck is going on? Oh, okay, something came out of the flower. And... Oh, it's like a... What the, oh, there's another flower with a different countdown? This is... There's no way this means something, right? Oh, buddy. <laughs> when this came out, everyone lost their fucking minds. Why? Can explain to me, like, very briefly why. It was like a big culmination of a lot of different, like, very dramatic plot threads, if I recall correctly. Because basically for the end of every chapter, there would be these, like, big, long animations, as you saw, that was like 14, 15 minutes. But, it, you know, on Tumblr, every time there was an update, it would be, even if it was like a single panel, like, everyone would lose their minds over the update. It, it was just such a, like... One of those lively communities that either, if you were on Tumblr and you weren't into it, you fucking hated the Homestucks because it, it was just like impossible to avoid. And as you can see, if you're not into it, it makes no fucking sense. No, I, I consider myself a relatively intelligent person. I believe it's actually impossible for me to, to know what's going on here. I mean, I read pretty much all of Homestuck. I fell off like right before it ended, I think. But I was deep in it and I still didn't understand what was happening. There are 128 named characters in Homestuck. Ooh, that's a power of two. I like that. Big fan of that number. So there was a Kickstarter for the Homestuck game, which by this point is out, that like made over a million dollars, I think something like that. But there was a $10,000 tier that two people backed, and the reward was... What? Yes. You would get your own custom character put in Homestuck for them to be killed off immediately. Oh my God. This has been like 20 minutes of Homestuck chat. <laughs> I'm sure some people are dining out on this right now. Yeah, and then everyone else is like having the same reaction as a lot of people on Tumblr did, did at the time. Do you know what the name of this episode is going to be? Cascade. Let's, don't do this. <laughs> So yeah, that's Homestuck, and I'm going to gloss over the, the AU. Nope, 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 nope. Read it. <sighs> Fuck me. All right, so each of the characters in our AU, like each one of them represented a different website. Yes. <laughs> I already love this. There was a girl who was uh, based off of Instagram who was like a photographer. And her name? Fern. And then there was Chad. <laughs> and this is written when? 10 years ago? Oh, fuck, this is 2012. Yeah, so eight years ago. Okay. Yeah. God, I don't even remember what his personality is. It, I'll tell you, Chad is YouTube. Let's see. Uh, and there's one who represented DeviantArt, and she dies really early, and everyone's really fucked up over her dying. Uh, a guy named Alan, who is the Wikipedia one. We have Gwen, who is Tumblr, who is just like really obnoxious and type. I figured one would be Tumblr. Yeah, and then there was the Twitter guy who was just like a dick. <laughs> this is rough to go through. This is 23 pages. And so you would have been 15 when you were writing this-ish? 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Rad. I'm not reading any more of this. <laughs> hey guys, it's Jarek here. I just had to cut five minutes of Brian trying to convince Layton to rehear AU. So here at Layton Night with Brian Wecht, we're known for nothing other than delivering on those promises. Most of the time. And that's a promise. Anyway, moving on. Please, God, this is the chapter of my life that I have tried so hard to repress. I also just want to clarify something I said earlier about us always delivering on promises. Just kidding. Yeah, if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you should know this. Sorry, we're, we're professionals. I was so excited for that, too. But whatever, I respect your choice not to read it. Thank you, as you should. Now I have to think about what fandoms was I in when I was, you know, 13-ish. So obviously fandom meant something very different when I was a teenager. You know, there weren't really these internet communities in the same way there are now. I was big into Dragonlance. I don't know what that is. It's a fantasy book series. I think we might have talked about this when we had TJ Connolly on. So Dragonlance was big. The Xanth novels by Piers Anthony, basically fantasy books, was like my big thing. Uh, like Xanth novels, which I believe I've referenced in the past. A series of like alternate universe things where everybody had a magical power. A little earlier was Lord of the Rings for me when I was in like fifth grade. Mm. That was my Lord of the Rings phase, uh, which I was hugely into. Fantasy books were, were really big. And then various adventure games, like computer games. I, I didn't really get super into arcade type games, but all the Infocoms, you know, all text adventures, that kind of stuff, could not have been more into Infocoms throughout high school. So that was a big, big like Zork, Enchanter, all that stuff. Have you ever played an Infocom game? No, I haven't. They are legit great. I mean, it, they're text adventures, and the writing in most of them is really, really good. They're super well-written and with fun puzzles and just, just great stuff. Oh, yeah. Didn't we talk about the Leather Goddesses of Phobos with uh, Anthony Carboni? Yes, we did. Nice. We got a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. That's a great game. Very, very hard, but... A great game and a good, if you like Hitchhikers. Oh, wait, did you play that on Game Grumps? That's one of the first things that comes up. Oh, yes, I did. Didn't I? Yeah, with Barry and Ross or me, maybe just yeah. me and Barry. I can't remember. No, it was, it was you, Barry and Ross. Wow. Wildness. Yeah, I forgot we did that. I feel like I would like these. You, you would definitely like these. Yeah, I was a really big Hitchhiker's Guide fan, as I would imagine most nerdy people now were. Oh, yeah. I haven't done this for a while, but for actually most of my life, I read all the books at least once a year. Yeah, I did the same thing. I had like the compendium of all of them. Oh, yeah. Did you ever end up reading the Owen Colfer and another thing follow up? It is so funny you mentioned that because I was just thinking about that the other day and I've never read it. No. Is there just one or are there two? I think there was just the one or I just stopped paying attention and there's more than that. How is it? Well, the thing is, when it came out, I was in middle school, and at the time, I was a really, really big fan of the Artemis Fowl books, which were also written by Owen Colfer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, shit, it's those two things I like. And now I don't even remember if I liked it that much. I get the feeling I probably didn't. It's just like, not the same. Yeah, I, that's why I didn't want to read it. I was like, you know what? Yeah. I love Douglas Adams. I'm not going to purposefully read something not by him. If everyone tells me it's amazing, I'll do it. But it seemed like the odds of that were, I mean, maybe it's great. I actually don't really know anyone besides you that I've talked about it with. If people were all like, you got to read it, it's incredible, I'd do it. Otherwise, not going to happen. Yeah, it's like, you know, you remember stuff really strongly from the original Hitchhikers. Like, it, it is so iconic. I used to do a thing when I was particularly bored and hanging out with friends, like in our dorm room, where I'd be like, take Hitchhikers, open it up to a page and ask me a trivia question about <laughs> anything you see on that page. And I could pretty much get anything there. I mean, not now I couldn't, but certainly, you know, between the ages of 15 and 25, I could probably answer any question about anything in any Hitchhiker's book. How much of that information have you retained to this day? Probably more than I think, but I haven't actually reread the Hitchhiker's books in at least five years. So definitely not a lot. Yeah, you don't have your annual read to go off of. Yeah, I, I should read them again because they're so great. I reread the Dirk Gently books mm. a couple of years ago. It was the first time in, in years. And 
the first one is just fucking awesome. It's so good. I really love it. I didn't watch a show they made out of it, but the first one's great. The second one is less so. It feels, it just doesn't hang together as well, but the first one is this beautifully intricate plot, and it's got some cool time travel stuff. I really, really love it. How do you generally feel about uh, time travel narratives? Well, Layton. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I, I love all time travel stories. I'm just such a sucker. It's like one of the things I keep coming back to. Generally speaking, you know, I have to not think like a scientist when I see a time travel thing because of course. it almost never hangs together, you know, and the ones that do hang together often are slogs, primer or primer, depending on how you want to say it, uh, is a great example. I, I like primer a lot. I think it's great. It is a slog. And yeah, we've discussed it on the show before. I really yeah, fucking yeah. hate that movie. <laughs> I, I like it. I think it's great. It's It requires a lot more work than most people would want to put into it. But, you know, all my favorite stuff, like Quantum Leap, Hitchhikers definitely has a bunch of time travel in it. Yeah. Star Trek got plenty of it. Pretty much all my favorite stuff has some time travel element to it. So, okay, what are my favorite time travel things? There's an episode of Lost, uh, which is justifiably famous, called The Constant, which is really, really great. It's an emotionally driven time travel story that is just hmm. really, really wonderful. There's the obvious like Terminator Back to the Future stuff, which is obviously the device in Back to the Future, the time travel device is mm -hmm. manifestly dumb, like <laughs> things gradually disappearing. What the fuck is that? It makes no sense at all. Of course. By which I mean, I completely love it. And that's one of my favorite <laughs> movies of all time. Like, it's one of those things where you just can't think about it that much because it really, that mechanism of people disappearing from the picture, it's stupid. Like, that is like a stupid thing. But within movie logic, it's super fun. It's super fun and it works great. So it's dumb, but it's dumb in the best way. Yeah, and none of the time travel stuff in Terminator really hangs together at all because they can't seem to decide what they mean by things. I think the only time travel thing I really like is Donnie Darko. And I just like, I don't like it as a structural, like tropey thing. It's not interesting to me. It's a lot like, wow, I really, really hate zombie narratives. Um, mm. They don't even remotely interest me at all. It's like the one horror thing that I just don't fuck with. No zombie? Like there's no zombie movie you like? No, I have not actually watched Night of the Living Dead. Um, I think I got like 10 minutes into it, but like, you know, I watched Walking Dead when it was on. Shaun of the Dead? At least Shaun of the Dead. I don't really like Shaun of the Dead that much. What? I'm not like I'm not oh. like a big Edgar Wright stan. Oh, wow. I love Edgar Wright. Yeah, it's fair. A lot of people do. I like the Scott Pilgrim movie. That movie's really good. Love the editing. That's great. Hot Fuzz is the best Edgar Wright movie, like in the Cornetto trilogy. It's just all right for me, dog. I don't, I don't wow. really care for it. Speaking of Hitchhikers, what was your take on the movie? I remember liking it fine when I saw it in the theaters and never watching it again. So I saw it when it came out in the theaters, being like, everyone's cool. It's got all these great people in it, right? Alan Rickman is Marvin. Yeah. Uh, Mostef is, who's he's Ford, right? Yeah, which is such a good casting choice. And then Martin Freeman, Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, I, I thought all the casting was great. Uh, Sam Rockwell, who's always fun. And then I n have never had the desire to see that film again. Yeah. It's like a one and done. It's not one of those like offensively bad adaptations. They did a great job and like, yep, it's a good time for, you know, 90 minutes or whatever. The, the best Hitchhikers thing, apart from the books, is obviously the original radio plays from the BBC. Yeah, that's what I was thinking you were going to say. I never listened to them. Oh, they're awesome. They're like a bit different from the books in some important ways, but I just used to listen to those constantly, like constantly in high school. <laughs> uh, I really, really like them. The acting's awesome. They're funny. They're wonderful. Nothing will ever, I think, beat those. I can't quite remember, but I, I think they were a little bit before the books or concurrent with the books or something like that. The, the There's some history there where their early Hitchhiker's books and radio plays were tied in together, and I can't quite remember how. I was a visiting grad student at Santa Barbara in 2001, and I went to see one of Douglas Adams's last public appearances might have even been his last, you know, because he died very suddenly of a heart attack. He's big into uh, ecology and uh, conservation, you know, towards the end of his life. He had this book, Last Chance to See, which was, you know, basically like kind of a book about animals going extinct and traveling around the world to find them. And he gave kind of a public talk and reading about, you know, something 
around this. And then I think like a week or two later, he died. Jeez. I think he lived in Santa Barbara and, and, you know, had agreed to appear on campus. And I'd never been to a thing like that, like a reading with like a fan Q&A afterwards. And he just came across as this really lovely, genuine guy. And it was so, so tragic when he died shortly thereafter. Yeah, that's so soon afterwards. When I was living in Savannah, Patricia Lockwood did a Mm. reading from her book, Priest Daddy, which is such a good book. Like, she's fucking amazing. But yeah, I went with my lovely friend, Allison, who listens to this podcast. Hi, Allison. I love you to death. Hi, Allison. (laughs) She is so deadpan and funny. Patricia Lockwood is, so is Allison, but... Patricia Lockwood is so deadpan and funny, and she had like a guy get on his knees and hold her cup of vodka for her while she was reading. And then afterwards, she did a signing, and she was like, I will draw any animal you want in this book. And she drew me a little possum, and it, it's a very like cherished object uh, and a really sweet memory. Allison and I were both going to SCAD at the time, and she was like, you art students are so fashionable. <laughs> Um, it was just precious but uh people listening if you haven't read any of patricia lockwood's stuff she's fucking brilliant she's so cool and like excellent twitter account rad i was gonna ask do you have any favorite short stories the one that occurs to me off the top of my head is the mask of the red death by poe have you ever read it no it's got all that like poey purple prose it's pretty great and, you know, gothically graphic. A little bit goes a long way with Edgar Allan Poe, uh, at least for me. But if you're in the right mindset and want that kind of language for that kind of story, that one I really, really like. I don't see people talk about this that much. I still have the complete works. I, I like Poe a lot in high school. So he has a story called The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar. And the conceit behind the story is this guy is dying. And as he's dying, he gets hypnotized. And basically, he dies and he's like communicating through his body from wherever the fuck he went. So, you know, that's the the core idea is what happens if you hypnotize a dying person? And Hmm. essentially, they keep this guy in a hypnotic state after he dies. And then when they, you know, snap their fingers or whatever, days or weeks or whatever it is, months later, the body completely liquefies. And I remember the final line or the final description of the story, which is uh, something like decayed into a mass of, and this is the phrase I remember, of loathsome, of contemptible putrescence. Ooh. Yeah. I never hear anyone talk about this Poe short story, The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar. I haven't read it in a long time, so it might be terrible, but uh, I remember really enjoying it for a while. What about you? Oh, boy. I fucking love short stories, so uh, I have a bunch of them that I'll rattle off. Love Joyce Carol Oates' Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Good Man is Hard to Find, uh, Flannery O'Connor. Yeah, that's a classic. It's so good. A couple of Stephen King ones. The Jaunt is amazing, and I only read this one recently, but Survivor Type. Have you read that one? No. It's a guy gets stranded on a desert island with nothing except a fuck ton of heroin, and then bad things happen. Uh, it, yeah. It's really delightful. And the final lines are lady fingers. They taste like lady fingers. <laughs> Spoiler, he uh, starts cutting off pieces of his body and eating them. Yeah. It's great. For a really fucked up one, the David Foster Wallace incarnations of burned children, which if any of you are sensitive to children being hurt, do not read that one. <laughs> yeah, I will not be reading that. Let's see, uh, Vonnegut, Harrison Bergeron, that's a classic, uh, and one I think of yep. often, The Velt by Ray Bradbury. Oh, I haven't read that in forever. Yeah, that's a good one. I love it because Disney Channel original movie Smart House is directly based on that short story. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, tickles me so much. Oh, fuck, how could I forget An Inhabitant of Carcosa and The Yellow King? Like, Oh, well, yeah, I figured. Yeah, like, obvious. Uh, fuck Lovecraft, Ambrose Bierce, and Robert W. Chambers are... The OGs, they're fabulous. I don't know if I told you, I just rewatched the entire first season of True Detective. I just rewatched the entire first season of True Detective. What? I, yeah, like l- last week, maybe? Yes, me too, last week. It's in my top three of favorite shows of all time. Just the best. Obviously, just the first season, but I've rewatched it so many times. 
while we were writing the cult ending for Dream Daddy, Vernon was like, Leighton, I need you to watch True Detective season one because it is exactly your shit. And for months I was like, ah. and then I finally watched the first episode and literally like 15 seconds in, I was like, this fucking rips. And then I it watched rules. the entire, I pulled an all nighter and I watched all of it. I rewatch it so much. I love the performances. It's really funny. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you are the Michael Jordan of being a son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The line that stuck out to me this time is when Matthew McConaughey is, you know, it's like present day and he asks the cops to go out and get him some beer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's his day off and on his days off, yeah. he starts drinking at noon. And then they give him a beer and he just like deadpan takes a sip and then deadpans. We almost had a situation there. <laughs> Yeah, and like right before they go out, he puts that dollar on the table and like blows it towards yeah, them. <laughs> blows it towards them. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, just like the the time skips in that are so deftly done. Like there's not a single bad performance in it. Like, oh my God, Michelle Monaghan, so good. So great. I've never read anything, but I'm sure plenty of pages have been written about the the role of women in that first season, which is... I mean, almost non-existent, right? But I mean, isn't that kind of what the show is about to a degree? Like the victimization and the like misogyny of cops? Yeah, 100%. But yeah, no, I, I agree with you. There's definitely some problematic shit going on there. Well, especially with like the Alexandra Daddario character. Oh you know, boy, yeah. Like, so what the fuck is going on with that? Like, she's just <laughs> an object. Yeah. Michelle Monaghan, though, is, I, I agree. I love her. She's just one of those actors that radiates like intelligence. Yeah, she she's like really well written too. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because rewatching it, I was like, man, so much of this shit shouldn't work at all. Like half of Russ's character is like the most cringe lord shit, and it just like absolutely works. Right. This is what I was thinking. Almost nothing he says is actually smart. It just sounds like it should be smart. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it, it it's like, you know, high school sophomore just read a philosophy book for the first time level shit. Uh, yeah, and and he delivers it so well, and the mm -hmm. directing and the cinematography is so great that you can completely get around his bullshit morality and philosophy and and, and treat it like something serious. But when you think about the words he's saying, you present it like you're, you're this genius, but actually you're this, this is not genius level shit. Well, I, I think that's part of what's so great about it is because like just every single person is a contemptible piece of shit. And it totally plays. You're totally invested. And then, like, the subtlety of the difference in performance between present-day Rust and, like, old yes. 90s Rust is just, like, fuck. That's so good. And um, the I forget the actor's name, but the guy who plays the quote-unquote killer, I guess, in the final episode, like, that guy is so good. And you know who else he is, right? You know what else he's been in? <laughs> Goran and Barry. <laughs> yeah, exactly what I was about to say. He's Goran and Barry. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Yeah. Go on, that is great physical comedy of you. He's awesome. He, he's a character actor that shows up in a ton of things. Glenn Fleshler. Which is a great name. Yes. Fleshler. Oh, yeah, he was in Joker. That's right. He was in Joker. Yeah. He's the guy who gives the Joker the gun. That's who he is. Yeah. Yeah, that dude's awesome. And I really love the the casting of like basically all the people that they go to interview uh, the throughout best. the course of the show. It, it's very like... You know, it feels so lived and a, a thing that as a Southern person, when there are shows or movies where people are doing fucking awful Southern accents, it bothers me so bad. And every single one in True Detective is like perfect. I know nothing about Louisiana, really. Mm -hmm. Like I've been to New Orleans twice for three days total or whatever. So the accents to me seem perfect. And also that whole like bayou kind of landscape is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a yeah. cool, uh, cool thing to look at. All I can do though, when I whenever I watch True Detective, is it just feels uncomfortable, like sticky and hot and gross. Yeah, everyone's very sweaty. Yeah, very sweaty. Ugh. Also, you know, episode four, that long take. Woo! Oh, incredible! That whole sequence is is amazing. Truly, nothing delights me more than harassing someone into watching True Detective Season 1, and they're like, fine, 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 fine. And then they text me a couple of days later, like, that was so fucking good. And then you're like, okay, now watch Season 2. 
I never watched season two or season three. I had no faith based on what I've heard from trusted sources. See, I think season three is legit great. Season two is, it was not as bad as I had been led to believe it would be, but it does not really hang together. And also, if you hate Vince Vaughn, then you should not watch it. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a hard note for me, bud. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you're not missing anything by skipping season two. Season three, you know, with uh, Mahershala Ali. Yeah, he he's the one reason that I wanted to watch it, and then I just never got around to it. And fuck, who's uh, Stephen Dorff? Thank you. Okay, I didn't even look it up. I want that noted. I would you you could listen. I wasn't <laughs> typing. I got there. <laughs> Stephen Dorff. Uh, Stephen Dorff is fantastic in that show as well. So season three, I thought was was legit good, and I would recommend you watch it. Oh, okay. There's nothing more dadly, I think, than being like, ah, oh, what's that character actor's name? And that is additionally always me. Oh, yeah, constantly. The unsung heroes of everything. It's just like, oh, man, you're really giving it your all. Speaking of rewatches, I have been thinking about doing a full rewatch of Mad Men because I haven't watched mm. it since it was like mm-hmm. on. Um, and that's just such a good show. And I watched it when I was a teenager, so I feel like I probably missed a lot of nuance of it. But Man, that show's good. I have not rewatched it since it was on. I saw every episode when it was on and haven't rewatched it since. Yeah, obviously one of my favorite episodes is uh, the one where the secretary runs over the guy's foot with the lawnmower in the office. <laughs> oh, of course. What a shocking moment. I remember that happened being like, what the fuck is going on right now? Yeah, fabulous. And then the rest of the episode is so fucking funny. <laughs> Which like, that show is super funny. Yeah, it's very funny. Absolutely. Oh, what a delight. I mean, it really did usher in that era of, I mean, same with Breaking Bad of like, oh, it's the antihero who <laughs> stop idolizing him. He's not cool. Well, I mean, but that was uh, Matthew Weiner before that too with Sopranos, right? Was he on Sopranos? I thought that was David Chase. Yeah, he was an executive producer on the Sopranos. Okay, cool. But my point is Tony Soprano is a bad boy antihero before Don Draper, right? Yeah, totally true. I mean, I would say most prestige shows by this point are pretty much taken bites out of Sopranos lunch. I mean, it, it's crazy watching that after the hindsight of watching it after watching most of these like prestige TV shows. It's good. I, I got to season four and then I stopped because I didn't have the attention span to <laughs> pay attention to it in the way that I wanted to. But man, it's as good as everybody says it is. It's so good. Yeah, I have to watch it. I'm watching Deadwood right now for the first time. How is that? Which is really, really great. Uh, have you seen Deadwood? Nope, I don't even know what it's about. I've heard of it. By the way, we're not doing What's Poppin' this week now because... This is the entire episode. Oh, is this like the Western thing? Yes, it's the David Milch Western thing with uh, Timothy Oliphant and Ian McShane. Mm. Ian McShane being the absolute best in everything. Yeah, obviously. I mean, it's just got everybody in it, including... uh, What's the guy's name? Fuck, William Sanderson. Brad Dourif is in it. Oh, are you kidding me? Brad Dorff is awesome in it. He's the doctor. You know, Brad Dorff, another person who's just incredible in everything. Brad Dorff is like this real, like, sarcastic, snarky doctor who's just trying to fucking help people and no one will leave him the fuck alone so he can do it. I love Brad Dorff in that. He's so good. I was watching, I think I mentioned on the show, but watching uh, My Son, My Son, What Have You Done? Yes. With uh, Willem Dafoe and Michael Shannon and Brad Dorff has like a really brief role in it. But again steals it shit i need to rewatch exorcist 3 because that movie's so good and he's in it and oh the best there's an episode the x-files where he plays a serial killer that he's really good in (laughs) born for the role Uh, of course chucky fuck he's in blade also right i've never seen blade so i don't know what you've never seen blade i have not wow blade blade is good blade 2 is phenomenal uh and i've never seen blade 3 because i hear it sucks All right, yeah, they'll be on the list, I guess. Wow, we are really going through pop culture. I mean, I feel like we haven't done like that kind of thing in a while. God, and we started with Homestuck and ended up here. Such is the nature of all modern culture. <laughs> what was the name of the T.J. Connolly episode, The Fertile Crescent of All Modern Culture? Oh, yes, you're um, right, it was. Yeah, I can't even remember what we were talking about, though. What What was that? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I, again, I don't remember shit about this show. All right, so... We have absolved the need to do what's popping because the entire episode has been what's popping so far. So, should we create a new segment right now, right on the spot? Yeah, I like that. Okay. Here, here, here's my idea for a bad segment. Ready? 
Okay. I'm going to navigate to a wiki, uh, a wiki, a Wikipedia, Wikipedia. Why do I, why do I have no confidence in my ability to pronounce that? Wikipedia, <laughs> Wikipedia. I'm going to say Wikipedia a bunch because now I, Wikipedia. Now I'm in my head about it. Wikipedia, Wikipedia or Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Jared, keep all this in. <laughs> Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Anyway, you're saying right. it Wikipedia like the Star Wars one. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about Wikipedia. I'm talking about Wikipedia. There wow, you go. I'm there so, you go. There I'm, it is. I don't see it. It didn't feel right. Anyway, I'm going to uh, navigate to a Wikipedia article and I'm going to scroll down and read a random sentence from it. And you have to try to guess what article it is. Oh, this sounds like it's going to be great. Do it. It sounds real boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. The Washington Post and Huff Post stated that the stature of the ceremony has declined in recent years. I'll give you a little more than that. HuffPost cited reasons such as lack of interest, declining attendance as a viewership, in 2019 ratings hit an all-time low for the third straight year, lack of musical diversity, lack of celebrity, lack of credibility, and access to music online. Uh, Eurovision? Nope. Fuck. About a ceremony. Sort of a ceremony. ceremony. Sort of a ceremony. Uh, Holy shit, I don't know. Hollywood blood rituals. It is the... MTV Video Music Award, Wikipedia. Shit, I was going to say MTV next. Ah, oh, man. All right, hold on. I'm going to do one now. Listeners, if this is as boring to you as I suspect it is, let us know. Yeah, well, it's kind of fun because then they also get to guess like what it could be. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to not say one of the words in the sentence because it's a little bit of a giveaway and I don't know how much you know about this. Uh, mm. So... Over the course of the blank murders, the police, newspapers, and other individuals received hundreds of letters regarding the case. Some letters were well-intentioned offers of advice as to how to catch the killer, but the vast majority were either hoaxes or generally useless. Is it Black Dahlia? Nope. This is definitely a thing I don't know much about. Is it famous, like BTK? It's famous. Or Zodiac? Nope. Okay, I'll say the name, uh, Whitechapel. Oh, Jack the Ripper. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Pretty much every sentence of this is like, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on one second. Talk. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi, Audrey. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Now, let me just tell Layton here that I cannot hear you, Layton. So you were talking okay. to Audrey all by yourself. Ooh. Audrey, what have you been up to today? Um, well, I've... um. I uh, I don't really remember so much. <laughs> I know the feeling, yeah. I was just thinking, when it's safe for us to hang out together, I would. Do you like playing with clay? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Sometime we should uh, make some little clay things together. I think that would be fun. We could paint them. Oh, sure. I would love to paint clay. Yeah, I miss seeing you. <laughs> How's Coco doing? She's doing good, but. She's been acting a little weird, and she's been, like, barfing up more and more water. What's the other thing Coco's been doing recently? I don't remember. With her butt. (laughs) Oh, she's been putting in people's faces and tooting. (laughs) Maybe it's been doing that, too. She'll sit on the back of my couch while I'm watching TV and just really let it rip and then act like I was doing it. You know, how dogs are. Oh, and sometimes Coco can go... (laughs) <laughs> I she can go like so long. Whew. That beautiful dog. A beautiful creature. Have you been playing any video games lately? Oh yeah, we've been playing Link to the Past. Ooh, do you like it? Yeah. We just got this third pendant. Now we're going to go get the Master Sword. Ooh, who's your favorite character? I think I'd like this. The third guy you had to be to get the pendant. The bug thing? Yeah, this Renipede. He's it's like so cool. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't played Link to the Past, but that sounds really fun. It is really fun. It's really nice to hear your voice, Audrey. I miss seeing you so much. Oh, and... You can come over to our house. We've been having people over for dinner. I'm sure very safely. Yeah, in the backyard and 
we pull six different parts. So you could come to join us for one of our dinners. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I would love that. Audrey, can you tell Layton about the, the comic strip you made? Oh, yeah. So I made a comic, but I uh, I don't think I can really tell you without uh, really showing you. <laughs> okay. Well, just describe it a little bit. So I made this little comic bit, but uh, chapter one, Super Tooth meets all the food. So like salt and pepper on the counter that's smiling and then salt and pepper's alive. And then they meet this watermelon and then a wall- you sh- I sh- draw a picture of a watermelon and then they meet the watermelon. And then soup has its own smiley face and <laughs> and a pan has its own smiley face. That sounds awesome. I would love to see it. Oh, and and then this mad blueberry is getting teased by pink lemonade. Make lemonade feels happy. But then Super Tooth comes in and he calls this the tooth fair, the food fairy with <laughs> um baking powder. Which she, spe- she puts it in the pink lemonade, and now he's then she flies over the counter. And po- chapter two is. Super Tooth. And I that's love this. when Super Tooth gets a cavity because a villain used a cavity brush to, to make the cavity in him. Then Princess Tooth hits the bad guy and feels proud. So, you know, you put your hands by fist on your side. Mm-mm, That's of course. Like a pose. And then. It's like a what kind of pose? And then it says, the end, but <laughs> is it? But then it says, but what if. What if Princess Tooth goes out on her own adventure? But before that, it's a uh, grass mark. Just fill in the space. Oh, that's why you put grass there, just to fill in the space? Yeah, oh. that's what mom said. And says, what if Princess Tooth goes on her, out on her own adventure? What do you think would happen in that story? You have a story to create. Ooh, are you, are you going to make the, the follow-up? Just make a sequel? Oh. Uh, no, it's usually you make your own story in this comic book. This is comic book for kids. And it has a lot of different pages. I like that. That sounds really nice. Yeah, a blank comic book that you can do whatever you want. Ooh, yeah. When I was your age, I made a lot of comics like that and like little books, mostly about like snakes. I really liked snakes as a kid (laughs) and lizards. Oh, you know what I really like? I like like everything. Uh, Most of a lot of stuff. I like fish. I like jellyfish. Jellyfish is one of the top ones. Really? I, I used to be really afraid of jellyfish. Well, I like moon jellies. They're just so cute. Right. They're really pretty. Oh, and another cute thing I think is very cute is, um, you know, one of those lizards with um, pokey uh, things on the side of their head. They're so cute and amazing. Oh, like uh, little iguanas or... Uh, yeah, little iguanas. Oh, and... One of my favorite TV shows is this new movie, Octonauts. The Octonauts are these animals that help sea creatures and other animals around places in the world. Oh, okay. But in this movie, there is an octopus called Koba, and she's so cute. What does Koba sound like? Koba, 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 Koba. Ooh. Yeah, this looks super cute. I like the little, um, the cat with the eye patch. Quasi. Okay, quasi. So the polar bears, Captain Barnacles, the penguins, Peso, the CIN um, is Shellington, the dog is Dashy. Sometimes they call her Dashy Dog. And then those little half creature, half. Vegetables are called the Vegemoles, <laughs> which are Tunip, Codish, Gruber. Which one is your favorite? I like Tunip. 
And tunip is half tuna, half turnip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks like there's a uh, Professor Inkles. Professor Inkling is an oh. octopus. Okay. That looks really fun. If you could be a sea animal, what would you want to be? I don't think I would want to be anything <laughs> except for jellyfish. They're so cute. Oh, and or a tiny octopus like Koba. She's so cute. Oh, and another one of my top favorite TV shows is this show called Number Blocks and Alpha Blocks. I haven't number finished blocks. Alpha Blocks yet, but Number Blocks I have. What do you think about math, Audrey? I love it. Number blocks start by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. They go all, all the way up to 100. Whoa, that's a lot of number blocks. But you like math? Yeah. They even start by zero. But they don't start zero. They start with one. That's the first gotcha. number block you meet. One. Is math your favorite subject in school? Oh, yeah. I skipped a lot of episodes just with one. <laughs> so I haven't really watched all the number blocks yet. Gotcha. Well, it's nice to have stuff that you're excited to watch. Oh, yeah. And one of my other top favorite movies or shows is Super Mario Super Show. Oh, that's a good one. Which characters do you really like? I really like Princess Peach and Koopa. I like that Koopa always fails. Like, he's <laughs> like, you're going to marry me. And she's like, oh, fine, I will. And then he doesn't get married to Princess Peach. I love Princess Peach, too. She's really cute. Yeah. Oh, and I've just started this one called Mr. Bread's Bakery. Mr. Bread's Bakery. Hmm. Or it's just called Mr. Bread. Oh, Mr. Bread. So there's this one that's a huge cupcake, and every other cupcake are laughing at him, but Mr. Bread helps him get a crown. Okay. Oh, now I want bread. Love some bread. <laughs> so now you want bread? Because I'm saying bread? Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> bread sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, so I was watching the show called... Charlie's Color Form City. And what's that one about? It's uh, about this person made of blocks who can, like, open a triangle for a hat, for his hat, and then he can, like, get shapes out of it. So do you do anything other than watch TV? Uh, yeah, I play board games. <laughs> like what? What board games do you like? I like Sorry and... Uh, Frozen Trouble, that's just another one, and it's called Olaf's in Trouble, but this is not a movie. Those sound fun. I, I really like board games. Right. Oh, she's taking the headphones off. Oh, goodbye, Audrey. I'm done. Bye, Layton. <laughs> I love you. I love you too, Audrey. Have a good day. Bye, honey. Bye, Dad. And she's out. <laughs> Fuck, that just made my day so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear her whisper, well, can I be done now? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Just heard, I'm done. <laughs> yes, she she looked at me. I, I don't know if the audio got it because it was pretty quiet, but she looks at me and she goes, can I be done now? <laughs> and then, I'm done, bye. So that's the name of the episode, right? Can I be done now? <laughs> can I be done now, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I love, I said bread and now you want bread. <laughs> Just yeah. incredulous. That was a pretty solid slice of her life right now. You got to hear about almost everything. She totally sounds like older. Like I haven't seen her in a while, but she sounds like, I guess her trains of thought sound like a little bit more complex than the last time that I talked to her. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's probably because it's been six months or something. Why don't we just move right into peaches and lemons? I feel like we're not going to do better than, you know, whatever that was. Yeah, Totally. Yeah, let's do peaches. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. <laughs> and then all the way, I was like, yeah, wow, we're really <laughs> going for it. Peaches and lemons. Peaches and lemons. Ryan, what are your peaches? Uh, well, one of them is that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's also one of my peaches. 
that was absolutely the best. I'm surprised she wanted to talk for that long. Uh, I thought she'd just come in and say hi or something, but I know me too. And she did talk about, I won't call it count. This is a separate one, but the, <laughs> the little super tooth comic that she made, it was so cute. Please send me pictures of that. I will. Uh, it's pretty, pretty great. Second peach is we've been writing more go banana go stuff. My kids band. And oh, sick. yeah, it's been really, really fun. So Jim and I have been writing with, uh, another person and I won't <laughs> say who, but they've been on the podcast and that'll be extra go banana go stuff with a special guest star. So that's been really fun. The songs are really coming along. Well, I love writing kids music. It's so much fun and it's so like silly and easy in all the best ways. Yeah. My final peach, I'm hesitant to say too much about this, uh, but let's just say I have a CD delivery coming to my house tomorrow, which Uh hopefully will put a certain band on track to have a certain album out soon. But things can always go wrong. So (laughs) (laughs) I imagine those CDs shall soon have your signature on them. Yes, they will. That is the goal. So that's good because we've been waiting for those for a while and they should be coming tomorrow. Fabulous. You're you're about to have a bunch of dry Sharpies. Well, the fun thing about Sharpies is half the time they're dry before you even open them. And yeah. then you open them, you're like, nope, chuck, 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 finally. Well, and like you don't find it out until you start signing the thing and you're like, oh no, this poor person who paid money for this. <laughs> This is going to look like shit. And then I'm always like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. If it doesn't show up, I will sign it over. For a while, we switched to Bic pens because they're more reliable, mm-hmm. but they're a lot wetter and take longer to dry. And so they're not like practical. I have learned so much about signing things in the last five years. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you my method for it. It's such a flex. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. No yeah. big deal. I just sign a ton of shit. You know what? I have a fourth peach. Will you permit a fourth peach? How dare you? How dare you be pleased and happy about a thing? (laughs) The fuck? It is that I joined Cameo. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, as did Aaron, as did Dan. Yeah, I've I've heard a lot about it from Aaron, who seems to be really enjoying it. It is really fun. You know, I'm obviously just getting a, a small fraction of what he gets. And people have not asked me to do weird shit yet, and I hope they do. (laughs) <laughs> no show feet. There, there haven't been any feet yet. Obviously, it, I don't want to turn it into like an OnlyFans thing. It's not the right space for that. So I don't want anything actually like, you know, n- no lewds. All right, everybody. But, uh, you know, I, I will do stuff people ask me to do. And so far, it's been kind of, you know, happy birthdays and pep talks and things like that, which are great. I was very reluctant because it felt kind of desperate, honestly. Uh, and it turns out that it's just really fun. The interface from my perspective is very smooth and well made. And, you know, it's just, it's a fun thing to do uh, while I'm kind of at home here. Yeah. And then you get to make somebody happy. Get to make somebody happy. And let's be honest, make a little money doing it, which is, is nice since all of our businesses have taken a big hit this year. <laughs> I'm looking at your page. You can get a message for $75, but for $9.99, what is a chat? It just means you can send me a DM. (laughs) Wow, paid DMs. Slide on in there. I mean, look, people can always tweet or whatever, but if you send it to me on Cameo, I like will see it. That's the difference. I'd be very interested to hear what people think about the pricing. You know, I don't want to be an asshole about it. Right. Right. And it's finding that line between you don't want to charge too little, but you obviously don't want to charge too much. I mean, even charging for it at all feels like a little iffy, but yeah, the, the flip side of that is... Because in our NSP emails, every third email is, will you say happy birthday to this person? Will you, you know, say this to that person? And you just don't have time to do it. I heard Hodgman, uh, John Hodgman, talk about this once. And it's not that any request is unreasonable. It's that when you get them all the time, they really start to take a chunk out of your day if you were going to do them. Totally. And in the beginning, when NSP was first starting out, we did these all the time. And... I stopped doing them, honestly, because people would never even say thank you. Like, Mm. you know, I'd go out of my way to like record a message for someone or whatever, and then you wouldn't even get an acknowledgement that you sent it. And after a while, it was like, well, fuck it. Why am I doing this? If, you know, like, I'm not, I don't want to be paid for it. It's just like, can't you just say thank you? 
You're just kind of tossing it into the void. Yeah. The nice thing about Cameo is that it is kind of making this transactional in a way that seems appropriate to me. I demand your gratitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May I say my peaches? Yes, please. I will do four because I, I feel like the Audrey combo truly does deserve its own peach because that was fucking wonderful and now I'm in a great <laughs> so, mood. Good. Isn't she the best? Oh, she's amazing. Like, good job on that. Thanks. I w- wish I could take some credit, but we just got a great <laughs> kid. Okay, my first peach is that I have always had a really difficult time turning my hobbies into work. And like, I have a really difficult time relaxing. And so I'll like finish working for the day and be like, you know what I should do? More work. And so I was like, okay, I need something that I can't turn into bullshit. And so when I was a kid, I was really big into playing with polymer clay. And so I just picked up some polymer clay and I've been making little mushroom guys and ring dishes and painting them. And, you know, I just forgot how good it feels to have like a tactile thing. But yeah, I'm going to pick up some aluminum foil and wire so I can make like bigger things that won't take three years to bake. But yeah, super fun. I love doing it. That's great. This weekend, I just like sat around and made some little stuff while I watched some Dead by Daylight Twitch streams. It was just super chill. My second peach is keyboard related, obviously. Mm. Oh, you know what? But it's been a while. We have not had a keyboard discussion in I feel like a couple months. Yeah, so this is probably something that I will tape and put on for the $15 tier for Patreon. But so the Ergo Docs, the split keyboard that I have is hot swappable, which means that it has the PCB, which is like the circuit board. It makes it so instead of spending a ton of money on a keyboard where you can only have one type of switch, you can swap them out whenever you want because you don't have to solder them. So currently I have MX clears on them, which, you know, pretty good. I like them. But I've been really wanting box jades, which is a very specific type of switch that's both tactile and clicky. And so I have one of them right here, and it sounds like this. That's very clicky. Yeah, so very satisfying and typewriter I found a bunch of them on sale, which is like kind of rare because switches like this can be expensive. And I'm waiting on a big bag of them. And I just like, I love doing the keyboard shit just because it's, again, like, a sort of tedious physical process. But that means that I just get to have like a super fun, clicky, different feel. It's going to feel like a whole new keyboard. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Rad. My third peach is... I'm, I'm going to be a basic bitch right here. Do it. Do it. It's pumpkin season at Starbucks, bro. Oh, fuck um, that. Fuck it. <laughs> Listen, I know who I am. I feel secure in my identity. I fucking love I love when Starbucks goes pumpkin. Nope. Literally, as we were recording this episode, I was licking the foam off of the top of my empty Starbucks pumpkin cream cold brew cup. <clears throat> Got a little pumpkin cream cheese muffin. Feeling great about it. Like, I love it. Well, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> Go, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's the kind of thing where it's like, You know, it was in vogue to make fun of girls for liking PSLs and wearing leggings and Uggs. Listen, leggings and Uggs are an excellent combo. Do they look good? Fuck no. But are they comfortable as hell when it's cold out? Yes. I miss Uggs. I'm not judging. You know, for me personally, and this is not a judgment, it's just a statement. I don't like Mm -hmm. pumpkin spice flavor because, of course, I hate cinnamon, which is a prominent yep. flavor in that which it's it's basically just nutmeg and cinnamon yeah i also hate nutmeg but i am pleased that you are happy yeah i mean happy is a strong word because that's <laughs> uh that's not a, a shade in my emotional spectrum at the moment i'm pleased that something you like exists again how about that yes yeah and Great. then we'll get into we'll get into the christmas season where they have their little creme brulee lattes and shit like Ugh. I've been frequenting a lot of like local businesses, obviously to support them because I would love for them to not go out of business. But you know, sometimes you got to be a little unethical about it. Why well, didn't go to Starbucks? Yeah, I go to Starbucks. I hate uh. to give them money, but they've gotten so much of my fucking money because for me, their coffee sucks so bad. Yes, it is bad. But I don't consider like a sweet cream cold brew or a fucking fancy ass latte. Like it's not coffee to me. It's just like sugar water like i'm a little hummingbird sucking it down and you know what it is i do not begrudge people their large corporate indulgences you know you almost can't exist as a human in this world without compromising your principles to some extent when it comes to these large corporations 
Yeah, no ethical consumption under late stage capitalism. Yeah, exactly. So, like, if you want to go fucking get a PSL, have fun. Get that PSL, baby. <laughs> <laughs> this was fun. We haven't done this in a while. This was really nice. Yeah, it was really good catching up and talking about some media. Also, I guess bonus peach, Deep Cuts finished it, came out last week, final episode. Yes, and it rules. You you just did such a great job with that. Thank you. Of course, much credit to Jarek for making it fucking awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I, I had a lot of fun doing the acting bits in that that made me miss acting a lot um, and doing the sound design <laughs> on great, yeah. me getting eaten by a demon and yep. having to text my neighbors to ignore me if I'm screaming like I'm being murdered. I'm not actually being murdered, uh, which they were all very chill about. I saw that. I like that. Yeah. So yeah, thank you everybody who listened to it and saying sweet things. I'm glad you enjoyed it or I hope you enjoyed it. If you hated it, that's valid. You're valid. You're uwu woo valid. But yeah, if you haven't checked it out yet, you should check it out. IMO, I think it's cool. It is cool. I will vouch for that. So yeah, I hope everybody listening is doing well and having a nice day and being patient with themselves and the world. This is the end of the podcast. Bye. Goodbye. Late Night is produced by Brian Wett, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com.